As I preach this word, I really do feel like it is a prophetic word for the house. It is prophetic direction for you. It's prophetic direction for your family. And so we're going to open up our Bibles. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 15. And once we read this scripture, then we're going to go into the, into the context of this word. How many of y'all are excited to be in the house of God? Amen. If this is your first time here, welcome. If this is uh, your second time here, welcome. If, if you don't know who this crazy Mexican standing up here, just welcome. It'll be all right. We'll, we'll get through this, I promise. Uh, Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 1. The word of the Lord declares like this. After these things, can y'all preach with me and just shout this with me? Say, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. For I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. I love this scripture because God is confronting Abraham in a, di- in a season of his life. And it's, and it's so specific that it says after these things. Everyone say after these things. There's some stuff that Abram's been through and we're going to dissect that today. But one of the beautiful things is that the word of God continues to prevail. That anytime you feel like you're in a stuck season, a stagnant season, or season that's been put on hold, the word of the Lord came. And this is why I want to be so uh, prophetic this morning, is that the word of the Lord comes when you're about to enter the second half. When you're about to enter your second level. And so today I want to speak to you about the victory of the second half. Everyone say the victory of the second half. Preach with me tonight and put some air in those lungs. Say the victory of the second half. Let's pray. Father God, we honor you, Lord, this morning. We give you honor, glory, and praise. Father, would you just come? No one here came to hear me. We all came to hear you, Lord. So we just say speak for your servants are listening, Lord, this morning. Would you flow, Lord? Would you speak to the hearts of every person in this room? Those watching online, Father, would you just invade this moment? We say Holy Spirit is welcome here. No other spirit but your Holy Spirit is welcome in this room. And God, we're just so honored to have you and you be the guests of honor this morning. So Lord, would you speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, speak to our spirit and activate something, Lord. Give us the strength. For the second half, in Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. High five your neighbor. Two, three people says, sell them victory in the second half. Victory in the second half. If we could put up, we got the slides up there, guys. Awesome. Huh? Oh, they're downloading? I'm sorry, man. All right, let me see. Sorry, they're probably too big of a file or something. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let me see if I could do this for you. Maybe this will be a little bit easier. Sorry, y'all. I'm gonna. I'm, I, I want to make sure that we have uh, the. Uh, do you know what computer that one is? Does that have AirDrop on it? Back room. Okay. Oh, MacBook. Okay. Anyway, just see if your AirDrop is on. I'll share it with you. Victory in the second half. Sorry, y'all, because I sent some slides to them. So I want to make sure they have our scriptures and everything that that we got to share. The Lord always comes with a specific assignment and a specific direction in certain seasons of your life. I'm talking to those people that are in a decisive season, in a critical season, in a season where you're asking the Lord, God, give me direction for what's next. How many of y'all have ever been there before? Right? Where you've been in a season where you don't have clarity what your next move in what, what's your next opportunity? What is your next uh, job opportunity? What your next business adventure is? Uh, what to do with your husband? Amen. Y'all have ever been there? No? Okay. Uh, what to do with your wife? Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't, God, I don't know what to do. This marriage is trashed. My children are like La Chupacabra, Osama Bin Laden, and, and La Cucaracha. I don't know. Like, they're just crazy. I mean, it's just like you turn on the lights and they scatter everywhere. Um, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. But... Uh, It's just crazy. There's moments that are very decisive, very crucial moments where you have to make a decision. And it's hard to make decisions for the second half when you don't have clear direction or a clear word from the Lord. 
And here we find Abram in a very decisive moment of his life where in Genesis 15 it says that there is a second half that he is about to, to enter, to, that he's about to endeavor, and yet there is something that the Lord wants to awaken. He wants to give him clear direction, and that's why Genesis chapter 15, it begins by saying, after these things. Everyone say with me, after these things. And so when we look at this scripture, it begins to awaken something in me because in order for me to understand after these things, or this one says sometime later, it's hard for us to really understand the context of what God is trying to do in Abram's life unless you read what's happened before, right? Unless you understand Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 14, then 15. So after these things, after what things? What had to happen in Abram's life for God to give him a direct word in this moment? And he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. There's something that was about to take place in Abram's life. And in order for him to understand the context of what God's going to do for the rest of this second half, you have to get the context of Genesis chapter 12. And so the prophetic word comes in a very crucial time of your life. Here, let me, let me begin by saying this. Anytime you're in a dry season, anytime you're in a stuck season, anytime you're in a season that seems like you've been put on hold, anytime you're in a place where it seems like things are not flowing, I'm going to tell you this, you're simply absent of a word. Anytime you're in a moment where it's dry, where you don't have clear direction, you're simply absent of a word. All you need in your life to have clear direction as to what the Lord is about to do, you need a word. A word will bring out of you the strength that's sitting on the inside of you. A word will begin to bring things to life that seem like they weren't flowing anymore. A word is what gives you the direction, the prophetic insight. It'll actually remove the blindness that you've had that'll give you clear direction as to where the Lord wants to take you. It is a word that begins to activate. That's why the word of the Lord is still alive and it is well. Anybody thankful that his word is still alive and it is well and it is limitless impossibilities that when the Lord speaks, things begin to happen? That's why in Genesis chapter 1, he didn't begin by saying, let there, he, he didn't by, begin by creating things with his hands. He began to create things with his mouth. Because he said, let there be, and there was. So everything that God began to say was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void, empty, and full of darkness. But then God opened his mouth. And when he opens his mouth, things begin to happen. Are y'all with me? When God opens his mouth, things begin to happen. As a matter of fact, you are the manifestation of a spoken word of God. Uh, Y'all are going to catch it about 4 a.m. You are the physical manifestation of a word of the Lord. If the Lord has ever spoken anything over you, you are walking the manifestation of what he's already spoken. And let me tell you something, when God spoke, let there be light, and there was light, he said, let there be sun, let there be moon, let there be stars, let there be, let there be, let there be. He speaks it into existence. But when he said, let there be light, the beautiful thing about this is that he's never told the light to stop. For 6,000 years, God's word is still creating. That's why NASA can't find the end of the universe. That's why NASA can't find, oh, they just continue to discover more and more galaxies. And it's crazy to even think that we're this little speck, little sparkle of dust in this universe. And we're here. And the truth is, when God spoke Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, let there be light. He's never said to stop. The beautiful thing is that there's no hell, there's no demon, there's no power, there's no depression, no anxiety, no fear that can stop what God has declared over your life. That if God has spoken it, and if you can just believe it, you better be sure that he will fulfill all that he's begun in your life. The Bible says that he that began the good work shall see it through to completion. So my thing is, Pastor, I want to give up. Pastor, ya me quiero rajar, ya me quiero ir de esta cosa que ya Dios me lleve. You cannot give up on what you didn't begin. Pastor, I'm going to give up on this. What are you going to give up on? You didn't start it. He that began the good work is the one that's going to see it through to completion. 
So it doesn't matter the warfare you fight. It doesn't matter the struggles you go through. What matters is that if you could just believe what God has said over your life, you better be sure that God is more powerful than any depression, any anxiety, any fear, any demon in hell, any power that can come against you. And so those of you in this room, if you understand this, you better understand that hell cannot stop what heaven has begun. Is anybody in this room? So there's victory in the second half. And when you understand this, you understand that there's a process, there's progress, but there's also a promise. And this is what I want to make very clear today. So in Genesis chapter 15, when he says, after these things, you have to understand that he's speaking to Abram in a place where he's already been through a process. And it almost seems that we've arrived to the halftime of Abram's life and God's trying to get him to understand something. Abram, the same God that was with you yesterday is the same God that will be with you today. And the same God that will get you to the promise tomorrow. So don't be afraid for I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So in order to understand this, let's understand chapter 12. And let's read in uh, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 and it says, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord, watch this, said to Abram, get out of your country. Everyone shout, get out. get out. Get out of your country. Get out of your family. Get out of your father's house. And I'm going to take you to a land that I'll show you. Now this to me, is, it blows my mind. Because God is telling Abram, at the very beginning of his life, there's things that you're going to have to get out of. Where am I going? That doesn't matter. I'll show you the land. But where's the land? I'll show you when you get there. How do, how do I know the land when I get there? I'll let you know that you've arrived to the place that I told you you were going to get to. The important thing is not where you're going. The important thing is what you have to let go of. He is very clear of getting out of your country. Get out of your your family get out of your father's house he gives them clear instructions of what he has to leave but he doesn't give them clarity of where he's going anybody ever been there you know you got to quit the job but lord what's next that don't matter you know you got to leave this you know you got to leave that boyfriend you know you got to leave that girlfriend that ain't doing good for you but lord who, who's my husband that don't matter <laughs> get out you got to leave your Sancho too. All right. And your side chick. <laughs> Are y'all with me? <laughs> you got to understand that the Lord is trying to get you out of stuff. The Lord tries to get you out of stuff to put you into something that you have never even imagined that he would take you to. But in order for God to unlock the next dimension of your life, you got to be obedient with what you have to let go of. And there's things in your life that you're going to have to let go of, not because the Lord uh, desires evil against you. It's because what's, what you have been holding on to is not God's will. What you've been trying to hold on to is not what the Lord has for your future. And so when he tells Abram, in order for you to understand that I'm about to take you to a place that is far beyond your imagination, I'm going to be, I'm going to get, take you from ordinary to extraordinary. I'm going to take you from, from good things and great things to marvelous things and exceedingly great things. But in order for you to even get there, you got to let go of stuff. And so Abraham begins to learn the technology of letting go. He begins to understand that there's things that I got to let go of in order for God to release what's next. God is the God that is perfect at closing one door and opening up another. He's the God that is perfect at shutting a door that no man can open and opening doors that no man can shut. He's a professional at this church. He's a professional at this. And so in Genesis chapter 12, he begins to give him vision. He begins to tell him, look, this is what I'm going to do with, uh, with you, Abraham. In verse number 2, it says, Genesis 12, 2, he continues to say, I will make you a what? Preach with me. I will make you a what? Great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. So the Lord begins to give him vision as to where he's trying to take him. But in moments where it seems like it's so difficult, why do I got to let go? Because I'm trying to burst something in you. Why do I got to release? Because I'm trying to bring something out of you that you've been carrying for too long, but you don't even know you're carrying it. And then he says in verse number three, continues to say, <clears throat> and I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
You mean to tell me that one decision is about to unlock the rest of my generations? Yes. You mean to tell me that my yes to you is about to unlock years and years and years of blessing for the rest of the nations and the world? Yes. You mean to tell me that there's people connected to my future that don't even know that they're connected to my future yet and they're going to be the result of a blessing just because I said yes today? Yes. Are y'all catching this right now? In other words, your obedience today unlocks the future of someone's tomorrow. Because there's someone in your future that you don't know right now that is connected to your obedience today. Your children are dependent on your obedience, parents. Your children's future is dependent upon your obedience. We cannot be men in this room. We cannot be cowards. We cannot be one foot in, one foot out saying, nah, I don't really know about this church thing. You better be sure. Because the kingdom of God is like the mafia. Once you get in, you can't get out. And if you're too much of a coward to even step in, then get out. Because that's how serious this thing is. It's the kingdom of God. And your children are dependent upon you saying yes to God. We cannot be lukewarm. We cannot be unwavering. We cannot be yes today, nah, tomorrow, no. Yes, I feel it today. We're, we're carnal. We're carnal minded. Right? That's carnality. It's when you can't make a decision for yourself. And not only you suffer, your wife suffers and your children suffer. So the Lord called you to be a priest of your house. Am I too aggressive right now? It's only going to get worse. Okay. So... <laughs> So the Bible says that he gives them this instruction, but watch number verse number 10. It says, <clears throat> sorry guys, I'm reading off the, now there was a famine in the land. Everyone say there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there for famine was severe in the land. How many of y'all have ever been through a dry season? Amen. Just be honest. Raise your hand. We pray for liars here too. So just be real. All right. You've been through a dry season. The money's not flowing. The job ain't doing it. You know, the, the, the finances just aren't happening. There's famine in the land. You know, you never thought you'd have to apply for food stamp, but now you got to go. There's famine in the land. And the truth is this. When you learn to manage famine, there's things that God will not teach you in a classroom. He has to teach you through the process. There's things that I cannot teach you from a pulpit. You're going to have to experience it. And sometimes you got to go through the school of famine because if you can manage the famine, you'll learn how to manage abundance. And sometimes you don't exactly manage abundance because you've not learned how to manage the lack. Even in lack season, you're still trying to spend it all. How much we got? We got a hundred bucks. Let's go. Let's go eat. Buffet. <laughs> I don't care. I might get unread, but it'll be all right. If you don't understand how to manage the famine, you won't learn how to manage abundance. If you're at poverty in your mindset, I can give you a million dollars right now and you'll become poor in just some time. Because the Lord always has to take you through the school of famine in order for you to learn to manage the abundance. There's, there's the process can teach you stuff that the classroom never will. And that's why the Lord has to take you through these different schools of management of how to steward your season well so that then it can prepare you for what's next. And so how do I go to the next level? I've learned to manage my happiness. I've learned to manage my joy. I've learned to manage my peace. I've learned to manage my mind. I've learned to manage my emotions. The reason why some of y'all can't advance is because you don't know how to tell your mouth to shut up. You haven't matured to the level of where you realize that not everything requires your comment. Somebody I like looking at your neighbor like, did you hear that? All right. True maturity, true maturity. Somebody just say, Lord, help me mature. Just, just prophesy over yourself. Now look at your neighbor. Just, Lord, help, help them mature too. All right. True maturity is when you understand that not everything requires your two cents. And the Lord begins to help you advance and steward your mouth, steward your mind, steward your attitude. Come on, somebody. Right? You don't have the control of the things that come your way, but you do have control of the attitudes you choose to have. You can't control the thoughts that come your way, but you can't control the thoughts that you allow to stay. And so it is not your fault 
of the stuff that you have to confront, but it is your fault of the stuff that you allow to stay in your heart. The Bible says, above all things, guard your heart. Why? Because out of it flow the issues of life. There's things that you have to guard yourself from. And you want to know something? The issues of your life were not the devil. They're your heart. So you're trying to pray against the devil, and God, the devil's like, I, I have nothing to do with that. Like, y'all, leave, leave the devil alone, man. He's out there bounded. He's bounded in hell. He can't do nothing. Well, Pastor, why do I got so much problem? Because your heart has problems. You haven't learned to be healed from your heart. You don't guard your heart, and out of the heart, out of the mouth, it flows the abundance of the heart. How can I know you're offended? I just hear you talk. How do I know you're bitter? I just hear you talk. How do I know you're going through offense? I just hear you talk. Your mouth will tell me where your heart's at. It's quiet in this Catholic church this morning. Come on. <laughs> your mouth will tell me where your heart's at. So all I got to do is hear you talk for about five minutes and I know exactly where you are. And it's important that we understand that if the Lord is going to mature us to a place of transition, of growth, of maturity, we got to deal with our mind. You got to deal with your happiness. You got to deal with your joy. You got to deal with your attitudes. You got to deal with your maturity. There's all these areas that the Lord is trying to form in you because it's all preparation for where He's going to take you. Someone say, I understand. So, chapter 13, the Bible says something very crucial. Let's go to the next slide. Chapter 13, it says that it is not the whole land before you. Here we find Abraham talking with his nephew Lot. Everyone say, Lot. Lot was a lot of problems, okay? That's who he was. Lot created a lot of problems for Abram. And here we find themselves, they're having a conversation. It is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. Come on. I, I, I don't know if this is some of y'all, but some of y'all just got to get this anointing on you and just say, you know what, just back up, fool. All right, just, just, back up, just back away. All right? I'm tired of you. <laughs> and there's, there's things that begin to happen in Abram's life where he's already learned how to get out of his father's house. Now he has to learn to let people go. He's already learned what it's like to leave his own city, leave his own country, leave his own people. And now he has to learn to get rid of people that have been trying to walk with him. You have to understand that not everyone that begins with you will always finish with you. This pastorship 101, Pastor Mondo, not everybody that begins with you always finishes with you. And I've had to become okay with having to let some relationships go. Because in this moment of Abraham's life, he's letting them know, hey, if you take the left, I'll go right. But if you go right, I'm going to go left. Wherever you go, Lot, I got a promise on my life. The promise of Genesis chapter 12 that the Lord's trying to make me a great nation. He's trying to bless me so that I could bless those after me. But this is the issue, Lot. There's something about you, man, that is not allowing me to see what the Lord has for me next. And we find ourselves now in the next, next, uh, next verse that it says... In Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, and the Lord said to Abraham, watch this, after what? Lot, what? Preach with me. After Lot separated himself, lift up your eyes and now look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Watch how important it was for Abraham to let go of someone that was actually becoming a veil to his future. There are people, literally, when you look at the name Lot, it literally means Vel. Lot, the name Lot means Vel. And what was happening is that Abram was keeping people around him that were veiling his eyes from tapping into what the Lord had for him. And the Bible says when Lot separated, he began to see again. Ain't it funny that when people leave your life, you begin to see again? <laughs> Ain't it funny that when certain relationships start leaving your life, you begin to see God again? Uh, pastor, but he, oh my gosh, he needs a lot of work. He needs a lot of work. But, he, but he's coming to church. With, I'm going to change him. No, you're not. No, you're not. He's gonna, I promise you, he's going to change you. He's going to become your veil. He's going to become your, your estorbo, right? He's going to become your hindrance. He's going to be, you have to understand that there's relationships that don't allow you to see God's promises. Sometimes you're walking in circle because of who's in your circle. And the Lord has to tell Abraham, let go and release. I don't know who that word is for, but somebody has to get this in their, in their spirit. 
Somebody's going to have to delete some numbers after this service. Some of y'all are going to have to start blocking some people after this moment. And be like, Pastor Humberto came and just gave me the best prophetic word. Block in Jesus' name. Some of y'all need a block anointing. Some of y'all need the grace to block. <laughs> Amen. I'm not saying people are bad. I'm just saying they're just bad for you. All right. So Genesis chapter 13, verse 18. Watch what happened right here. Verse 18. Then Abram moved his tent. Everyone say he moved. He moved his tent and he went and he dwelt by the timbrinth of the trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And he built an altar there to the Lord. Watch. Abram moved his tent. I want to t- let you know today as a prophetic declaration over Limitless Church, do not pitch your tent in a place of transition. Stop trying to pitch your tent in a place where God has already moved from. It is so important for us to understand that God is continuously moving. And if he is continuously moving, God never stops with one generation. It always passes on to the next. He started with Abraham, but then it passed over to Isaac, and then it passed over to Jacob, then it passed over to Joseph, then it, and it just continued to pass around because God never finishes the full thing with one generation. Amen. It's always passed on to the next. And the danger that we can find ourselves doing is pitching our tent because we're emotionally broken, and so we pitch our tent here and say, it's always going to be like this. And God says, I've already moved. Do not pitch your tent in the place where God is trying to get you through. And this goes with relationships. This goes with people. This goes with opportunities. This goes with business. Stop trying to pitch your tent where God's trying to get you out of. The Bible says he dwelt in his tents. But there's always changes that come. How many of y'all thank God for changes? But some of y'all trying to wear, right? Some of us trying to wear winter clothes in summer. Like, The pastor standing up here. I'm like, dude, I'm burning up in this jacket, man. Why did I do this to myself? It's 115 degrees outside, man. And you begin to understand that if I, how many of y'all know, if I'm in winter and I try to bring winter clothes to summer, or if I try to bring summer clothes to winter, what happens? You get sick. Because what was supposed to be covered in one season cannot be covered in another. And then sometimes you try to bring too much covering into another season, and it's going to get you, you're going to die of a heat stroke, brother. Right? And you have to understand that if you don't change with the change, the change will change you. If you don't learn to transition in moments of transition, you'll stay stuck in the past. And that's the last people that that happened to. They stayed stuck wandering in the desert when they were supposed to enter a promised land. We're not going to wander in this season. Somebody prophesied to yourself, say, I'm not going to wander in this season. I'm not just going to be walking in circles in this season. I'm going, to be, I'm going to stand firm and I'm going to believe for God that where the Lord has taken us out of and what he's putting us into, he's taking us from great to extraordinary, from the ordinary to extraordinary in Jesus' name. Amen? So the Lord begins to give Adam, I'm sorry, Abraham this process. And in Genesis 14... Here's another thing that Abraham has to go to. Watch this. And now when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house, and he went to pursue as far as Don. If you read the whole chapter 14, all it is is about war. The whole chapter about war. Abraham having to go to war because these fools done kidnapped his nephew. They kidnapped his family. They came after his house. They came after his people. And now Abram has to go to war. I don't know about you, but God just, done, God just told me, get out of my house. And I left. Then I got to deal with my nephew. And now he's gone. And I got to go back to war to go save him? My God. It's like, what is happening right now? Everyone say process. Everyone say process. There are things that you're going to have to learn to fight through. There are some battles that you're going to have to learn to go through. But the beautiful thing about this is that the God, it's not just where you're going, it's who's going with you. It's not about just me standing in this battle not knowing what's going on. It's understanding that the God that is with me will sustain me, will strengthen me, will allow me to go through what I have to go through to get to where I got to get to. And this is where I begin to understand that it's actually the Lord that fights my battles. It's not me. 
It's where I begin to get the revelation that the Lord that is with me is far greater than any mountain, than any giant, than any lion or any bear that can come and confront me. Whatever's trying to attack my life, guess what? It's not big enough for the God that I serve. Do I have any believers in this room right now? Right? Whatever darkness has been trying to steal my kids and my family and my children, whatever depression and anxiety and fear that has tried to enter my home, I have to understand that even though the enemy came in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against every enemy and every force of darkness that has tried to come and take away my family, my kids, my marriage, and my home. You begin to learn how to fight in the spirit, not in the flesh. Pastor, I'm from the kingdom, but I'm from the west side though, Pastor. I'm in the kingdom, but I'm from the west side of the kingdom. Right? I fight. I strap. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, don't mess with Pastor, back then, if you mess with me, ooh, Pastor. <laughs> Some of y'all te agarraban las grenias, right? <laughs> but why were you more aggressive in the world and don't intercede in the kingdom? The fight that we fight is not flesh and blood. It's against power principalities, forces of darkness. And while your hands could do the work, now your mouth has to learn to do the work. You have to learn to intercede for your kids and say, devil, you came into my home. You try to attack my daughter. You try to attack my son. You try to come in like a flood, try to strip my marriage away from me. But guess what? Me amarro la falda, baby. You just, you just mess with the wrong one, baby. <laughs> right? And you say, in the mighty name of Jesus, I decree, declare, and I prophesy over my house, my children, and my home. God, I bind this child. I bind my son to the kingdom of God. I bind this husband to the kingdom of God. No addiction, no depression, no anxiety, no fear, no sickness, no cancer, no tumor. Nothing is going to strip the promises of God in my life. You begin to learn to fight in the spirit. That's where the real battles begin. And after these things, everyone say, after these things. Woo, what a battle for Abram. He done got to learn how to do all these things. And then God says, after those things, oh, yeah, don't fear. He's like, God, what kind, of, what kind of mess you just got me through? I mean, you just got me through so much mess right now. And then I'm here in the second half of this year. I'm just starting the second half of this year. And the first words the Lord wants to tell you, don't be afraid. But it almost seems like things that were with you in one season and one half are no longer with you in the second half. And that's where I begin to feel the burden of the Lord for this house. When the Lord has to transition a people and say, when one generation leaves, your pastor's celebrating with Jesus right now. The founder of this house is celebrating, walking with you, cheering us on. Be like, man, I can't wait till y'all come up here, baby. This is, this is a party up here. But now we got to get ready for the second half because it's not over. The war ain't there. The war is here. He ain't worried. He's happy. He's enjoying being at the feet of Jesus. And we're the ones that got to deal with all this mess. And he's just cheering us on, baby. You're going to get through. It's a father looking down at his son saying, I'm proud of you. A father looking down and saying, I'm proud of you. The pleasure of the Lord is over you. And this is where he begins to talk to a man named Abram. He says, after the stuff you've been through, watch me. Watch me. And in Genesis chapter 15, he begins to go from the process to a progress. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things. Everyone say, after these things. He begins to tell him, hey, I know you've been through separation. You've been through battles. You've been through war. You've been through processes. But now you're at the second half, not just of this year, but the second half of the rest of this ministry. The second half of the rest of this house. The second half of the rest of this church. The vision hasn't stopped. Because I want to tell you something. We die, but the purpose never dies. Because the purpose is eternal. The purpose of God in our lives is, the, is from the place of eternity. That even though the man leaves, the man has left the earth, but the purpose hasn't left. And this is where God begins to speak to the life of Abram. And the word of the Lord, watch this, the word of the Lord comes in a vision. And I find it hard to, like, how does that happen? Am I hearing or am I seeing? Well, what if what you hear is what you see? 
Isn't that how the prophetic word works? That you begin to see because you're hearing. The word of the Lord came in a vision. And this is what gets me every single time. Because now you have to understand that what you're hearing is actually becomes what you're seeing. The reason why you don't see right is because you don't hear right. If I had you close your eyes right now, everybody in the room, close your eyes. I want you to see what I'm saying. Pink horse. Purple mug. Open your eyes. Did y'all see the pink horse drinking a purple coffee? <laughs> Did y'all see the unicorn in your mind? You're just like, pink horse? Oh my God, I just went to a whole unicorn. You just changed that whole horse to a unicorn. The truth is, you see what you hear. The prophetic word of God doesn't happen just because of what I see. It happens because of what I'm hearing. Faith comes. Faith comes not by seeing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. La comadre. No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Telemundo. No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Walter Mercado. No. Univision. No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you hear the word of God, it begins to activate your hearing and your hearing opens up your eyes. The reason why you can't see what's ahead is because you're not hearing him. Pastors, because I can't see, it's because you're not hearing. When was the last time you were in his presence and you heard his voice? When was the last time you were in the presence of the Lord and you begin to get clear direction? The reason why sometimes we can't see is because we don't hear. And the Lord begins to tell Abram, I need you to see. I need you to see. Do not be afraid. Everyone say, do not be afraid. afraid. Say it like you mean it. Do not be afraid. afraid. These are words of transition, Mundo. Don't be afraid. Because do not be afraid means be strong and courageous. It's the same words that he uses when he's about to transition Joshua. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. These words are words of transition. Break the fear. The fear of the unknown. The fear of I don't know what's going to happen next. The fear of everything's gone. The fear of that's how we always used to do it. But the fear of transition. It's do not be afraid. For the Lord is with you. Does somebody understand this this morning? The Bible says do not be afraid. And he says I will be your shield. This is where David begins to get a revelation because he doesn't just say the Lord is a shield. He says the Lord is a shield around me. Anybody that knows that you, when you have a shield, the shield only covers one side of you. But the shield that you got when God says I am your shield, what he's saying is I'm the shield not just in front of you, but I'm the shield all the way around you. And that means that no matter the darts that come your way, even the ones you can't see, I'm protecting you from. Even the stuff you don't see, even the stuff that's happening behind your back, I'm still protecting you. Because I'm not just the shield in front of you. I'm not just the shield of the stuff you can see. I'm also the shield of the stuff you can never see. And that's why no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. Because even the weapon that is formed, even the weapon that tries to come against you, it will never hit you. That's what David couldn't understand. He didn't understand how Saul, the king, who was trained in battle, kept missing him with spears and javelins. He, David didn't understand how is it that this guy that has been trained to throw can't hit me. He realized, unless there's someone protecting me from the stuff I can't see. And that's where David began to grow. And God uses those same words with Abram. And he says, do not be afraid, for I am your shield. There's no attacks that can come in this second half that the Lord won't protect you from. There's no issues, no battles, no turmoil, no testing that the Lord won't protect you from. He will protect you. He will guide you. He will guard you. He will be a shield around you. And he's going to be a shield around this house. And because he's around this house, he's around your house. Everyone say, I receive. The Lord begins to declare, I am your exceedingly great reward. This is what I feel prophetically for this house, that what is coming in these days is that the word, the literally the word reward means I will be the God that will compensate you. 
I will be the God that will give you restitution and retribution. In other words, there's going to be an accumulation of resources that the Lord has reserved for you. That in the moment of the second half, he says, now I'm going to drop it on you. Resources, finances, retribution, uh, compensation will not be a problem for this house. I wish I would have shouted right there. I wish I would have received that right there. But I said, the things that you've been worried about, you will not, no longer have to be worried about again. Because finances for this house means no worries for your house. Everyone say, all my bills are paid. All year for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. You'll never have to worry about another water bill again. You'll never have to worry about another utility bill again. You'll never have to worry about any other thing again when you understand that the God is the God of your second half. There's a blessing and an abundance that's going to reign over this area, over this house, over your house, that you're, you're, you're no, if I could tell you, look at your neighbor and tell him, watch me change right before your eyes. Tell him, you better respect me. Just tell him like that. You better, because tomorrow I might be your boss. <laughs> I wish y'all would have received that. Come on. <laughs> Some of y'all, the reason why you can't receive it is because you haven't been expecting. Some of y'all have to learn to become, put yourself in a place of expectation. I'm expecting good things to happen. I'm expecting God to come my way. I'm at, is anybody here in expectation in this room? I'm expecting God to open doors. I'm expecting the heavens to open. I'm expecting the rain to come. I'm expecting the abundance to come. I'm expecting the reward to enter. I'm expecting God to let it rain over my house. I'm expecting it. Right? The reason why you don't expect the rain is because there's no seed in the ground. But whenever when the rain is only, is only your enemy when you're on vacation. Right? But the rain is also the sign of abundance that for those that have sown seeds and are waiting for the rain to come. Because the rain is the announcement that the harvest is still yet to come in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord says, I'm going to be your exceedingly great reward. And this is what I want to close with. Band, if y'all can, y'all can come and help me. We're going to close this thing out. There's a compensation, Pastor Mondo, that the Lord wants to bring to your house. There's a compensation that is extremely multiplied and exaggerated. Amen. I literally wrote this down. There are going to be people that are not going to know how to handle the level of exaggeration that is coming. Let me say it one more time. There's going to be people that are not going to know how to handle the level of exaggeration that the Lord is going to bring over this house. When the Lord exaggerates, it's, a, it's because he's a, an above and beyond type of God. And I'm not just trying to preach to you to get hyped in a message that is about blessing. I'm trying to teach you how to get excited about the promises of God. That he took me through the process. He took me through the progress. And now he's about to step me into the promise. And the promise is the place of fullness, of abundance, where I never have to experience famine ever again. It's the place where the Lord began to prepare you for. It's the place that allows you to understand that everything that I've been through was the prerequisite to get me to where the Lord wants to take me. And now I'm standing in the very place of the second half of this, of this year, understanding that the Lord's promises are still yes and amen. That what the Lord didn't finish with one generation, he'll pass it on to the next. And what we begin to build from this moment on is not just for your generation, but for your next. Some of your generations are sitting on your lap. Some of your generations are still in your, in your womb. Some of the generations are still yet to come. And yet the Lord is saying, this house will be a generational house. This house will understand that there's far beyond that which we, whatever we could think or imagine. And I begin to feel from the Lord that the tension that you've been feeling is about to become your extension in this season. The tension is about to become your extension for the next season in Jesus' name. Your seed is about to open the door 
of what has already been given in the spiritual realm. If you continue to read Genesis chapter 15, the Lord begins to promise all this stuff to Abram. And the Lord, it's almost like Abram's like, all right, God, I get it. You want to do this with me. It's almost like you want to give me this wire transfer of exceedingly great reward. What do I got to do? He said, prepare the sacrifice. Read Genesis chapter 15, and Abram has to prepare a sacrifice. The Bible says he begins to get these animals, and he begins to put them at the altar. And the Lord began to come in between them. And the Lord began to receive the offering of Abram. This is what I want you to understand, is that there's reward that the Lord wants to bring to you. But there's things that you're going to have to learn to lay at the altar. There's things that you're going to have to lay at the altar of the in-between. Lay at the altar of the second half. And say, God, I'm not going to take this with me to where I'm going. I'm going to allow this thing to die right here. I'm going to allow this thing to be laid right here. And I want to tell you that this altar is only an altar if it alters something in your life. If nothing alters, then this isn't the altar. But this is the altar of the second half. And there's things that you've been carrying whether it be depression, anxiety, fear, worry, insecurities, low self-esteem, whatever you've been trying to carry, this is the altar of the second half. And I want to prophetically declare that if whatever gets laid down right here today, you're not going to take it for the rest of this year or the rest of the second half of this place. If you believe that you have victory in the second half, stand up to your feet and shout and say victory in the second half in Jesus' name. Come on, I want to prophesy over you. Lift up your hands. Father, I declare over this house limitless that what you begin, you will see it through to completion. You will see it through to completion, O oh God. You will see it through to completion, O oh God. I will prophesy, Lord, over this house because this is your house that victory is their portion, that the end of this year will finish in victory and not in defeat, that whatever you begun, you will see it through to fullness, full completion, God. And Lord, I thank you that today it marks the ending and the beginning of a new thing. Father, we are in month number eight, the month of August, the month of new beginnings. And today, God, you are prophetically declaring that Limitless Church has entered a new beginning. Limitless Church has entered into a new beginning of a second half. You will not enter the new year. You will not enter the second half defeated but in victory. You will not enter the second half of this year feeling oppressed, depressed, and in anxiety. You will come out of this room knowing that you have the joy of the Lord, that you have the strength of the Lord. And I strongly feel the strength of the Lord coming over this house. Those of you that have felt weak, those of you that have felt depleted, those of you that had felt like worrisome, like you have been carrying a burden that doesn't belong to you, the Lord says, I'm about to give you the strength of the Lord and with the strength of the Lord comes the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength. So you will not carry a burden that doesn't belong to you. You will begin to carry the burden of the Lord. The burden that gives you joy for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Begin to carry the burden of the Lord.